Okay, well, um, for the next six weeks, so I guess next five weeks, six weeks including tonight, uh, we're going to be looking at making sense of the Bible. A lot of what we're looking at is going to be how to go from reading the Bible to applying it to your life. Now, in order to get there, we got to get a little bit of uh, preliminary stuff out of the way. But tonight, we're mostly talking about translations, and we're going to start looking at what's called the interpretive journey. Um, I'll explain that in just a minute. In your folder, you have a couple of things, and we'll add to it as we go. Each week, you get more stuff to add into your folder. Uh, first off, there's a book in there. This is a real basic book uh, for just a kind of um, an, an easy reference guide. So uh, maybe if it's been a while and, and you're just kind of trying to figure things out or something you just want a little more clarity on that we talked in there, a lot of it is going to be in that book. Um, I mean, it's a very easy read. You could pro probably wipe it out in a day. Um, if you're a slow reader, a couple of days, it's not going to be something that really ties you up. Next up in there is a is a it, it's a picture, and it shows a old town, old time, old timey town, and a bridge and a river and all that. That is an interpretive journey. We'll, we'll, we will be taking a look at that. And then next in there, you have uh, a list of resources. These are different things to help you in your personal Bible studies. There are websites, there are YouTube channels, and there are some books. Basically, to make it as easy as possible to find something that can help you in your Bible study. Um, I would, would mention one thing very specifically. Uh, a lot of times, uh, specifically in, in, in Christian circles... People want to know what the Bible says, so they get a book called Vine's Expository Dictionary. Expository Dictionary. If you have this, throw it away. It is super inaccurate. It is not, no. In any, if you take any kind of a Greek or a Hebrew class, they're going to tell you right off. Everything that you get in Vine's is just, it's just not true. It's not accurate. So if you have a Vine's, uh, don't really take that thing for the gospel truth <laughs> at all. And then the last thing I just handed it to you is a Bible translations guide, and we will look at that in just a minute. Um, it's going to walk you through some basic, uh, basic translations to see um, a Bible translation that works uh, for you. Um, let me take just a minute or two in case there's anybody who's going to watch this later or in the room uh, who maybe they're not well acquainted with the Bible. Um, if you're very acquainted with the Bible, just hold on. It'll just take a minute or two. The Bible is a book of books. There's got a total of 66 books in it. Um, and it is written by somewhere around 30, maybe a couple over 30 people. And it was written over the span of 1,500 years, uh, which is amazing considering the level of cohesion that's in the Bible. Uh, I know a lot of... Uh, fantasy books that were written just over a couple years difference, and there's so many different loopholes and, and plot holes and, and stuff. I mean, if you guys watch fantasy on, on TV, you'll just see a lot of times when, they're, when their storyline will just kind of be... That, that contradicts what you said in episode one, you know, and maybe you guys aren't big TV watchers, but you'll have to take my word for it. Uh, the Bible is split up into two sections. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament is everything before Jesus, and the New Testament is... Uh, uh, everything, everything after Jesus. Uh, the Bible does not tell us everything. The Bible does not tell us everything. It doesn't tell us everything about history, about science, about anything. It doesn't tell us everything that there is to know. It tells us the things that we know, need to know in order to be saved. Not even necessarily that, because you can get saved without the Bible. It tells us what we need to know for guidance in our faith. Okay? So there's going to be scientific discoveries that aren't mentioned in the Bible, historical details that are not mentioned in the Bible, because the Bible's point is to guide us in the faith. And Paul mentions that the Bible is, can, is, is profitable for, for correcting and rebuking and, and coming to maturity. So these are all good things. Um, but once again, uh, if you go to the Bible expecting for it to be something that it is not, you're going to be very sadly mistaken, or... Disappointed, I mean. Next up, uh, obviously, God is not finished speaking to the church just because the Bible has been finished being written. 
But any time that there is uh, some kind of new revelation or prophecy, it always has to be subject to the Bible. Otherwise, what you have is you have a bunch of different people saying, well, I feel like God said this, and even though it goes against the Bible, I feel like it's true. Well, if your feelings are the decider of what's true or not, what is true is going to change every couple of years because you're not going to ever really feel the same about every single thing that you feel about. So uh, prophecy always has to be subject to, um, to the Scripture. And, and the reason for this is because they share the same source. See, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives prophets their prophecy, and the Holy Spirit is the one who guided the biblical writers to write. So was the Bible written by God or men? Well, yes. It was written by men. They were the ones who wrote it down. You can definitely tell their distinct personalities in the um, when you're translating. But very much so, it was also uh, given by God. Um, All right, so... Um, A good example of, of this is there's been a lot of people who said, I have special revelation. I know when Jesus is coming back. No, you don't. Because the Bible said, nobody knows the hour. Well, that was then. We've got new revelation. Yeah, but your new revelation isn't compatible with the Bible. So it's not true. See what I mean? So don't let people mislead you with these different th things. They will come. There's, there's always going to be more of them. But uh, if they say something that's not uh, according to the Bible, then you just kind of throw it out. God doesn't contradict himself. He's not unstable. Um, and the last thing that I want to say, just a real basic thing, and just in case there's anybody watching later who, who is new to the Bible, whenever there's a Bible reference given, such as Jeremiah 3.7, how that works is the book is mentioned first. If you're not familiar with the books of the Bible, they're listed at the beginning of your Bible. And uh, then there's a big number, that's a chapter, and then little numbers, that's verses. The verses were not in the original manuscripts. They have been added after the fact to help us find resources or find places easier. Um, actually, we're going to be doing a, a Bible study of the book of Hebrews on Wednesday. And you'll see there how a lot of times he quotes the Bible without getting any, any references because they didn't have verse references to give. So he just says, as it's written somewhere, <laughs> and it's written here somewhere else too. So now that we've done that, we can look at the basics of uh, translations. The biggest issue, the single biggest issue that people arrive at when they are having a problem understanding the Bible is the translation that they're using without fail. That is the single biggest issue. And the reason for that is because as you pray and, and study the Bible, God has a way of speaking to you. It doesn't take the world's smartest person or the, world dumb, the world's dumbest person. Anybody God can speak to as they read the Bible. Anybody. But what happens is we get a translation that we don't understand. So I, I, I fall a little bit of a, of a pattern. If you're over the, and this is on your sheet, if you're over the age of 60, I recommend the New American Standard Bible 2020. Okay? So NASB is what that's called. If you are a graduate student, I recommend the English Standard Version called the ESV. If you went to college, you graduated from college, I would recommend the Christian Standard Bible, CSB. And if you just graduated from high school, I would recommend the New International Version, NIV. And if you had trouble in high school, I would recommend the New Living Translation, the NLT. I'm not making fun of anybody. If you're a smart person and you're using a basic Bible or, or you know, you're not an educated person using one of the other Bibles, not making fun of you at all. I'm just saying this is uh, the kind of standard that I've seen that it makes it a lot easier to get something out of the Bible. Um, I know me personally, I am, I, I have completed some grad school, and I have a hard time with the ESV. So I like to go to the NIV or the CSB, uh, even though I did some grad school, because I find it's easier for me to not zone out. You know what I mean? If you're reading the Bible over your education level, you, you're going to have a hard time zoning out. Or under, you're just going to get kind of bored. So that, that's kind of the, the, the idea there. And you could ask, well, why are there so many different translations? Because translators think differently about the same issues. And when, when you're translating, there's, there's a wide array of what could be translated. 
complicated. So and I'll get right back to that. But first I want to just mention the King James Version. Why I did not mention the King James. First off is because of its age, but it doesn't really mean the same thing as it did when it was translated. And the language has developed so much that people have a really hard time understanding it. So for that reason, I recommend people do not do not read it. The second reason I recommend people don't get into get a King James is because the manuscripts that they used for the King James were later dated manuscripts. They didn't have access to the old ones that we have now. So some of the translations aren't aren't really good um, because they were working from manuscripts that just they didn't have the manuscripts we have now. Um, and the last reason uh, why I don't recommend people get the King James is simply there's a lot of issues with translation that come up. And I'll give you one specifically, but I don't want to make this like a big thing. Uh, Romans 8.28 says, and well, in the King James it says, uh, I, what a time to have a brain fart, huh? Uh, Romans 8.28 says, uh, all things work together for the good for those who, okay, and it goes on like that. That's the issue, okay? It should read closer to what the ESV has. God works all things together for good. There's a difference. There is a very real difference. Things don't just magically work out to our good. They don't, they don't do that. God is working in the things to work for our good. See, there's a bit, very big difference. And if you have this idea that everything's just magically working out, well, you're going to have a lot different view of the world and of God uh, that you would if you were reading a more accurate translation there. Um, besides those translations, translations, there are two translations I'm going to steadfastly request <laughs> that you never read. Um, the first one is called the Passion Translation. This is a newer one by a guy who I believe his name is Simmons, if I remember correctly. He is not qualified <laughs> to translate. He, he's not, he never un understudied under a Greek master or a Hebrew master or anything. Um, he was not a part of a translation committee. Um, all that he does is, is he said that he re got secrets revealed to him about how the ancient languages worked, and then he just... And it's not really even a translation. If you compare the, the manuscripts that we have to the Passion Translation, I don't know what he was smoking, but that's not how you translate that. That's not a translation. That is just... He wanted to incorporate kind of charismatic themes. Um, I mean, it's, it's fun for like a, a pleasure reading, like something you'd read in high school, but if you want to know the Word of God, the Passion Translation is not it. And I'm not talking about like the message or the NLT where it's just like a real basic paraphrased version. I'm not talking about that. I mean, he just put stuff in there that's not what the original manuscript was saying. And then the second translation I want to mention specifically by name is called the New World Translation. This translation was put out by the Jehovah's, Je Jehovah's Witness denomination. And the idea behind it was they wanted a translation that would support their church doctrine. So they did their own translation and just kind of made it fit what they taught. Which that's never a good idea. You don't want to go to a translation with, with this bias saying... I want to support my church's doctrine. You want to go to the go to the Bible with fresh eyes and saying, "How can I? How can I change? How can I? How can I be taught from this?" Totally different uh, mindset there. Now, I'm sure you guys, at least some of you, have heard about the missing verses of the NIV and it's demonized and ah, it's Satan's translation. Not, not really, not really. I know it, it sounds good when you have a YouTube video where he's talking about how they took out these verses to do it. No, no. See, what happened is when they first gave the verse-by-verse -verse designations in the Bible, they did it with the manuscripts that were not as reliable. Well, time passed, and we got a lot older manuscripts, and we were able to see that those verses weren't there originally. So they removed them from the translations because they weren't there originally. They'd been added years, and in some case, cases, decades after. So in order to keep the original reading as Paul or Luke or whoever else wrote it, they took the verses that were added out. Nothing demonic there. Nothing, nothing scary. I know you're going to watch a lot of YouTube videos. They're going to make a big deal about that. It, it's not, not that. Okay? Um, those verses were added much later. 
Um, and they do have them in the footnotes of most of those translations anyways, so if you're really curious to see what verse they removed, you can just look down. Um, and so then the next thing is we believe that the Bible is what's called inerrant in, in the sense of God. And there's a slight difference between infallible and inerrant, but we're not really going to look at that tonight. Uh, the idea behind inerrant is without error. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I have never heard of this u- word used outside of the sense of God. So... In case you're one of those people who's just like me, inerrant simply means without error. That's it. Um, now, we believe that the Bible is inerrant as it applies to the original manuscripts. But here's the thing. <laughs> we don't have any of the original manuscripts. We only have copies of the original manuscripts. And you could say, well, hold on. So how do we know what was originally written? Because we have so many copies. We have thousands of copies. <laughs> There, there is a 98 to 90% chance of absolute certainty of what the original manuscript that Paul or Luke or John wrote. The only big sections that, we, that, that is still in question is the ending of Mark and the ver- story in, in John where he's talking about the woman who's going to get stoned and Jesus writes in the sand. Those are the only two big sections. Every other place that is uncertain whether that was the original reading or not does not affect translation at all. And by the way... The ending of Mark and the story in John doesn't affect any major doctrine either. If you take out all those things that were still questionable, you still have Jesus was God, died for us, is the only way to heaven. I mean, all the core things are still there. It's just a matter of a few small changes. So nothing to really worry about. And there's a lot of books out there if you want more details of the uh, uncertainties. Um, I can kind of point you in the right way if you want to know. So we do not believe that the copies that we have are inerrant. And we do not believe that any translation that we have is inerrant. Okay? There is no such thing as an English version that is inerrant. Paul did not use the King James Version. All these, all these English versions can have errors in them, um, which is why it's so important that we study and we continue to try and, and figure it out better. Um, next up is I'm sure some of you have heard the idea of a literal translation. Which is the most literal translation? Let me rip this band-aid off as quickly as I can. There is no such thing as a literal, tra- literal, literal translation. It doesn't exist. Okay? As soon as you get past that, it's a lot easier to get more out of the Bible. You're told that, hey, you know, this, this Bible is more literal and this one's more paraphrased or, or you know, word by word versus thought by thought. That distinction isn't really real. And the reason for that is because languages are not a puzzle. There's not a one-for-one equivalent. Anybody who knows more than one language will tell you this exact same thing. There's not something as, oh, well, this is what it, and so we immediately translate over to here. There's, no, no, no. There's what's called a semantic range. Okay? And I'm saying this stuff, I know it sounds boring. Okay, just hang in there, guys. We'll get to the more in-depth stuff in just a second. If you don't understand translations, you're going to have a hard time reading the translation. Okay? It is, this is important. I know it doesn't sound like it, but just hang in there. Um, Pu- languages are not puzzles. There's a semantic range. What that means is that every word has a range of meaning which is determined by the context in which it appears in. When you're translating, you don't just go through... First off, Greek is not written in word order like English is. You, did, you know what word is functioning as what by the ending of the word. Make sense? Lagos is word, pre- pre- predominantly. It can mean a lot of other things. Lagu means of the word. Now, of and the were not there. It's still one word. But the inflected meaning it requires that we add English words to get the Greek meaning across. Okay? This is important because a lot of times people say, well, you're adding to Scripture. Or you're taking away from Scripture. No, you're not. I'll get to that in just a second. So it's not, translation is not a puzzle. And it's not always e- easy to know which way you should translate it. Think of, I'm going to use this analogy from Bill Mounts. Uh, think of it, a translation like a bundle of sticks. Each word is a bundle of sticks. And there's different sized sticks in that bundle. Now, some of those words are going to be like those bigger sticks. More often, they're going to be translated that way. But that doesn't mean always. And here's another, another important issue, is that in English, some words carry a nuance that were not there in the Greek, and vice versa. So there are some Greek words that have a nuance that don't carry over into English. 
Greek has some um, phrases that, that make sense in the Greek, but then you translate them over and people just kind of well, miss it. And that's why it's important in some translations to just go ahead and change how it's worded so that the modern audience can understand this. See, this was the issue. The Roman Catholic Church said, look, these people are going to miss all these things. They're not going to get it. So we need to make sure that we leave it in Latin so that these, these people don't twist Scripture. So they had a good idea going on. The problem was is that it kept the Bible from people's hands. So yes, yes, what their concern was very valid, but it, it still is worth the risk. Um, I'll give you two examples of um, kind of the idea in translation. Greek does not have an indefinite article. If you don't know what that is, a or an. It does have a definite article. In English, that would be like the. Okay? But if you were to ask a question, what is the literal meaning of the, word, of the definite article? And which is ha. Well, now you have a little bit of an issue because sometimes it's not translated at all. For instance, Jesus in Greek is written ha yesu. You don't say the Jesus. You say Jesus. But in Greek, you write ha yesu because you put it before a, uh, a name, um, personal name. And so then you have that where it's not listed at all. But then you, it can also be translated as the. It can also be translated as a pronoun. Or sometimes it's simply a grammatical marker that tells you that these two words are connected. So all that to say this. Literal translations don't really exist. Think of the English word run. What does the word run literally mean? Well, it doesn't have a literal meaning. It, you can use it to say run up a bill, run with legs, run out of time, run to the store, run a, run a business. All these ideas of run are different, but it's the same word. Um, another Greek example is what a lot of times people have a big fuss about. There's a Greek word in the New Testament. It's adelphos. It, it, more often than not, it's like your, your, bro, your blood biological brother. Now, in the New Testament, it's used as brothers in Christ, not blood brothers, which they were kind of reusing the same words to mean something else. Well, here's the issue. In those passages, is he talking to the whole body, or is he only talking to some in the body? In the Greek, it carries the idea that when you say brothers, he's talking about the body of Christ, which includes boys and girls. So in English, a a very good translation would be brothers and sisters. But there's a lot of people nowadays who say, you're adding to Scripture, or you're twisting script. No, not at all. That's what the idea is behind the word. That's how translation works. If you're not going to translate it in a way where people understand it, why translate it at all? So, you know, probably not the best thing to get a translation that you don't understand. And whenever you hear somebody being real contentious about translations, stop and ask if they actually know the ancient languages or how they work. Because more often than not, it's an issue of, I don't know what I'm talking about. I watched a video, and now I have a bunch of opinions about something that I just don't know what I'm talking about. Um, if it's not that, and they actually do understand the ancient languages, they're just tre they're treasuring tra tradition over being able to get something from the Word. So, um, okay. There's another issue here. Ancient languages were not as precise. You're going to run into the Bible a lot of times in the stories where you're going to say, that's a contradiction. That's not true because over here it says this. So let me just kind of, before you get to that point, let me just run into this. Ancient languages were not as precise. In the Gospels it says, there were these two people here. Well, in English, this is how we think. Two people, that means there were two people and only two people. There were no more than just the two people. But in Greek, you can say there were two people. Like I could say in Greek, there were two people that came here. That doesn't mean that there were only two people. See, in English, we, don't, we think more precise than that. If I say two, that means there were two people. If I say 12, then there were 12 people. But Greek doesn't, and ancient languages in general don't really work like that. Um, another good exa example is the global flood. Every, every one of your modern translations is going to say the, the water filled the whole earth in Genesis. But there's very little justification in the Old Testament to warrant that it was a global flood. I'm not saying it was not a global flood. Could totally have been a global flood. I'm saying it's not worded like that. It could just as well be translated, the land filled the whole area. There's nothing wrong with that translation. 
But the problem is, is that once the King James Version established a certain translation, all the other translations kind of went with it. So now we have, was it a global flood or not? I don't know. I wasn't there. I know that there was a flood and everybody got killed. I don't know if that meant a global flood or not, but I know that God's wrath came down and punished people. That's what I know. See what I mean? And so it's one of those things where that's just how translations work. Another good example is from Joshua. It'll say, so then the Israelites went and they killed all the people in such and such city. But once again, that doesn't mean that they killed every single person in the city. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, then why does it say they killed all the people? <laughs> once again, the way words were used in ancient languages were not as precise as they are in modern languages. Uh, it could just as well, well as, um, just as well be kind of given the idea of uh, there were a lot of people who were killed. And you know this is true because, in, for instance, in the book of Joshua, it says this city, they attacked the city, they killed everybody there. And then a couple of chapters later, they go back over there and there's still people there. Well, what happened? <laughs> Did the Bible miss, mess up? No, the Bible didn't mess up. It's, t- it's saying they killed a large, large force of them, and that's just ha- that's how they wrote back then. If you read, like, for instance, the Egyptian manuscripts of, of, their, of their conquests or maybe the Assyrian, uh, their, the Assyrian um, war conquest annals, that's what it's called, the Assyrian annals, you're going to find the exact same wording that the biblical author used. So don't, don't get too scared about that. That's not a contradiction. Um, and here's another good example is forever. God said in the Old Testament that he would be with Israel forever in the temple. The word that's translated forever is more an ongoing thing without, an, without a definite length of time to it. So it could have just as well be translated, I will be with you throughout the generations, or I will be with you moving on from here, or something like that. You know what I mean? We translate it for, <clears throat> forever to get the point of God's um, unchanging character across. But when Jesus set aside the law and set aside the temple, he was not making God a liar when he said forever. That's just an issue of translation. Once again, we can get into more of that stuff later. I just want you to understand that when it comes to translations, there's no translation that has it right. Okay? There's a bunch of translations that will help you at different areas to understand something better or worse. Okay? Get the translation that you understand best. And uh, that's really the main idea there. So as far as the translation process, your major translations are translated something along the lines of this. There's a group of people together, usually at least 30. And they, they get together, they translate the different things, they check each other's work, and then they discuss, and they go, and they go through and make sure all the editing is, is right on. That's typically how it's done. When somebody like myself, a personal person, uh, translates, there's a lot of issues that come up. First off is bias. I have bias when I'm translating. I am biased that I believe that God still works miracles today. So when I am translating, that's going to come across in my translation. I am biased in that I believe that the Holy Spirit is still active in the church today. That comes across in my translations. And sometimes when we're reading from Scripture up there, I don't use a certain translation. I just translate it myself to put it in words where people understand it. That's not wrong. That's, once again, just trying to make it easier for people. Another issue that comes up in translation is the words are not in order. If you don't know what you're doing, you're just going to get a crazy translation. You have to consider the context when you're translating. You have to consider the argument that's, that's being said. Um, a lot of times people have come to me and, or other people and they said, you are misquoting the Bible or you're adding to it or taking away from it. Here's the thing. No, because, and I want you to get this, translation is imprecise. It is somewhere on the screen probably. Yeah, there it is. Translation is imprecise. Translations are not where, oh, I have the exact perfect... Th- no, it's... See, I, I come at it from a different viewpoint, and my translation is going to be worded slightly different than somebody else translating the exact same thing. Because words have nuances to them, and that's just kind of how it works. Um, and each translation is going to have variations. So you, once again, you might ask, okay, so why did you waste our time talking about all of this? <laughs> because if you don't understand translations or how they work you're not going to find a translation that works for you. You know how many people I, I, I've met that they say, the King James Version is the only one that got it right. All the other ones are wrong. So then they go the rest of their life reading a Bible that they don't understand, and they think that they get brownie points for reading a book that they don't understand. 
Okay, if you want to read the King James, have at it. Have fun. Really, I'm not going to tell you not to. Well, I am going to try. Actually, I'm going to tell you not to. But <laughs> it's not wrong or immoral. Okay, it's just an issue of um, trying to understand. So two examples that I think, and then I'm going to give very quickly of translating where you do not add any words makes the Greek sentence completely un, uh, uh, nonsense. It makes it nonsense. The first one is in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. If you translate it straight from the Greek without adding a single word, which is impossible, as you see on the screen, uh, but you, you're left with something like this, book, genealogy, Jesus Christ, on uh, son David, son Abraham. It doesn't make much sense. But you didn't add a single word. Translation requires that you add words, and it requires that you take words out. That's just how it works. In your Bible, it's going to read something along the lines of um, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It's going to read something along the lines of that. Now, once again, though, I had to add words to make it understandable. Another good example is John 1.3. All through him caused and without him caused not one that has. What? Yes, exactly. That's exactly the point. Uh, very hard to understand. It should read something like this. All things, it's an implied word, all things um, through him were created. And without him, there's not one single thing that has been created. Something along the lines of that. Something along the lines of that. So you see how translations... Get the idea of literal translation out of your head. Just whatever you've heard somebody say, they were wrong. They didn't mean to be, but they were. So just get it out of your head and move on. Uh, another issue in the Bible is that what it means is not always the same as what it says. You might say, how does that work? Well, here's a good example. When you pray in the name of Jesus, right? Isn't that how the Bible tells us to pray? Pray in the name of Jesus? Well, what we do is we pray for any old thing. And I've seen people do this. God, I want a Porsche in the name of Jesus. That's not really what it meant. Well, that's what it says, and I'm standing on it. Well, no. When you pray in the name of Jesus, you're praying in the authority of Jesus, which means you're praying as he would pray. You're praying in, the, in his authority. So you can't ask for something that's outside of his authority when you're praying in the name of Jesus. See what I mean? You can't just put on the name of Jesus on whatever you want. and It's God's, you know what I mean? Uh, another good example is it says in Matthew, where two or more are gathered and pray about anything. Well, he doesn't really mean anything. He's talking about anything when it comes to the topic of bringing correction in the church. Another example, Matthew 7, 1 says, do not judge. Now, if you take that verse by itself, it means you should never judge for any reason. But if you keep reading, it says, but first take the log out of your eye so that you can see clearly to judge. And then elsewhere, he also tells us, Judge those who are judge the judge the body. It also says, you know, that you should be judged. And it says, judge wisely. There's lots of different things that the Bible says about judging, but we ignore all of those <laughs> because Matthew seven one, out of context, says, "Hey, do not judge." Um, so pay attention to the context, and this is on your sheet. The context is simply put: the surrounding content. The context is the surrounding content. This can be the verses before and after, the themes that are being discussed in that part of the book, the main idea of the book as a whole. Take, for instance, uh, when Jesus curses the fig tree. It says that it wasn't season for the fig tree to even have anything. It wasn't the fig tree season. And then he says Jesus went up to the fig tree and there was nothing on it because it wasn't fig tree season. And so God curses the fig tree and you're left thinking, now what is going on? Why would you curse something when it's not even that thing season? Well, if you're not paying attention to what the themes are going through that part of the Bible, you're going to be at a loss. Another example that comes to the top of my head is when people say, Jesus said, this, trans this generation will not pass away before they see the sun come in his glory. And then you're left with the problem. That generation did die away and they didn't see it. But what's the very next part that happens in, in that part of the Bible? Jesus goes on top of the mountain and he's there with Moses, and his face is transfigured. It's called the transfiguration. Kind of unoriginal, but whatever. <laughs> and so he goes up on the mountain, he sees this, this experience, and three of his disciples are there. This is the fulfillment that he was talking about. See what I mean? But once again, if you ignore the context, you're left with a bunch of questions. 
So it's really important that as you read, you pay attention to the context, get a translation you understand, and pay attention to the context. If you're not paying attention to the context, you can literally make the Bible say anything. You can make the Bible support having multiple wives. You can make it condemn it. You can make the Bible support having slaves. You can make it condemn it. You can make the Bible say anything that you want if you don't pay attention to the context. Very important. When you find someone else, or when you or someone else finds a supposed contradiction in the Bible, hold on, keep studying, you will get the answer. And the reason is because the Bible interprets the Bible. In fact, the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. If you just hang in there, you'll get your, you'll get your questions answered. That takes us to the second uh, roadblock that people find in, uh, in understanding the Bible. And that's this. You're not in the right place up here. You're not in the right place up here. And this is what I mean by that. So well, this is going to be a multiple-part answer. First off, pray. When you're reading the Bible, you're having a hard time understanding the Bible, pray before you go to the Bible. The reason for that is because the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible, and that same Holy Spirit, you can pray and ask that he help you understand the Bible. It's the same Holy Spirit, and he wants you to understand it. So whenever, you, you, whenever you're trying to study the Bible, make sure you incorporate prayer in it as well. Second off, know your biases. Some people might be racist. Some people might not believe that God is who he actually says he is. Well, the Bible says God is this, but I don't really believe that. Some people um, think that he doesn't hear, or maybe your request is too small, or maybe you think that you don't matter. Well, I know that I matter because Jesus died for me, but I mean, not like really matter. Like, he, he, it matters enough for him to save me, but not enough for him to really care about my day-to-day life. You know what I mean? And so then you get into these little things, and those are the biases that are in the back of your head. Do you believe that miracles are possible? Do you believe that they still happen today? Who is Jesus? If you don't believe that Jesus is God, you're going to take that into your Bible study. And the same as you must know your, know your biases, you have to be willing to change. See, your feelings... Uh, your bias, your belief, they affect how you understand the Bible, and you have to be willing to change. You might be wrong. And then the last two things I would say about, about this, this roadblock is, first off, when you come to Scripture, come to learn. Come to be taught. Don't come to the Bible, don't come to the Bible wanting to Correct it, criticize it, um, censor it, teach it. You see people do this all the time nowadays. They go to the Bible, well, I don't like this. Just can ignore that. I mean, take for instance, you guys remember, I think it's called the Health and Wealth Prosperity Teaching. You guys remember that? Which pretty much ignored the entire book of Job. You know, hey, if you, I mean, it, a lot of Christians nowadays, they, they believe in karma, right? So... Good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. You just, you know, karma can come back at you. Once again, the book of Job. I would once again like to point to that. Uh, when you go to the Bible, read it as though you're reading it for the very first time. I was in this Bible class back in college, and the, the, the teacher was this German guy. Uh, so German that when he brought his, his wife back to meet his dad, you know, for the, for the first time, he says, Levi, das gut. You know, this is a real German guy. And uh, he was teaching this class on, 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 on Bible study. And he mentioned that there was this doctor. And there was this younger guy that wanted to be the apprentice of this doctor. So he goes and he says, please, please apprentice me. And the doctor says, okay. For day one, here's this piece of paper. He says, okay, great. What do I do? What do you want me to do? You want me to, to go take care of that or over here? And he says, no, I want you to go look over that. Look at that fish over there. And so he goes and looks over. There's a fish in a, in a, uh, in a little fish tank by the window. It's just minding its own business in the fish tank. And he says, okay, what do you want me to do with the fish? He says, I want you to just look at that fish. For how long? Just look at the fish. And then he says, I want you to, uh, to write 20 observations that you find just looking at the fish. He says, okay, and then one. He says, oh, that'll be enough. So the next day he comes back. He says, okay, what do you want me to do now? He says, okay, here's a piece of paper. He says, okay, this is... 
might not be good. And he says, okay, I want you to go back to the fish. No, not the fish again. So he goes over to the fish again. And he has to go with 20 more observations. And the doctor does this five days in a row. Finally, he says, doctor, I came here to learn from you. I came here to study. What are you doing? I, I, I don't care about the fish. I, I've seen everything there is to see about the fish. And he says, no, 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 no. You just scratched the surface. Another example, to, before I say what I'm trying to say here, when a young boy gets a letter from a young girl, and they're lovesick, and they, oh, they think this is all that there is for that little boy and that little girl are the love of each other, right? And so they pass notes, and when they get that note, they study it through. They make sure they have every line memorized. They want to know exactly. What, when they're done, they read it again. They want to know exactly what, what's being said, and, oh, this is so exciting. See, when you go to the Bible, you have to see it with fresh eyes. You have to slow down and really study it. When we read the Bible, most of us just kind of blow through it. Well, I know the story. I'm not really into reading this today or whatever. We don't slow down to notice the details of it. And so the question is, what did you miss? Not, oh, I already know this. Forget about that. Don't ever go to the Bible saying, oh, I already know this. Go to it with this mindset. What did I miss? What can I still get from this passage? The Bible has layers. And what that means is that you can know nothing and you learn something from the Bible. Or you can know everything and you can still learn from the Bible. And I'm not talking about knowing facts about the Bible. I'm talking about application, the word applying to you. And that takes us to the last thing I want to talk, talk, talk about tonight. So before I get there, any questions on translation? Any things you guys don't understand about translation, you, you, you just need, need some help to better understand the Bible there. No? Okay. I tried to make it where you can get something no matter where your experience is with the Bible. That takes us to what's called the interpretive journey. Um, if you look at your sheet... Um, in your blue folder, the one with the picture of the old time in it, old time town in it, um, and then the other sheet, the fill in the blank. We're going to kind of work through this together. The first picture on the far left is one where it shows uh, kind of an old timey town, and that represents step one of the interpreting the Bible. Okay, and that is grasp the text in their town. Another way of saying that is, what did it mean to them? What did it mean to them? What words are being used? Who, who was it written to? Who wrote it? What is happening historically at the same time that the book is happening? Uh, and then what is happening in the book? Um, and then you, you kind of summarize it from there. So a, a good example would be, well, in, John, in Genesis, such and such, God told Abraham to, you're saying what it meant to them. Who was it written to? And there's a difference between observation and application. We are not at application yet. Step one, the whole what did it mean to them, it's about observation. And you know that you're doing a good observation when you use words like they and them. When you use words like, like us, you've moved to application. Paul told us, eh. Paul told the church in Rome, See, observation is about them. You're trying to understand them. What is it written for? What's the idea there? What's going on there? Um, and I'll give you, we're going to do a little practice here uh, from 2 Chronicles 7, 12 through 16. This verse is oftentimes quoted in the church to talk about America's need for repentance. And if we're going to look at it and see, does it actually have anything to do with America's need for repentance? And I would agree, America as a nation does need to repent. One among many nations that needs to repent. But this verse, we're going to look to see if it actually has anything to say there. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. If I shut the sky so there is no rain, or if I command the grasshopper to consume the land, or if I send pestilence on my people and my people who bear my name, 
humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. My eyes will now be open and my ears attentive to prayer from this place, and I have now chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there at all times. Some very big things, some very encouraging things, some very good things. So this, at this stage, we're not trying to say, what does this have to do with us today? We're trying to ask, what, why was this written? So this was written because Israel had built a new temple. Solomon was the one who had built it. And they had built it in the land that God gave his people, Israel, who is now more or less the land of Israel and Jordan and lower Syria. Uh, and so this is, this is what has happened historically. The book was written by Jewish scribes because the people had been kicked out of their homeland. They, they were in exile. And those Jewish scribes were, were writing this down. And the reason why they were writing this is because they wanted to do three things. First off, they wanted to explain the situation. If we're God's people, why are we exiled? The second thing that they wanted to do is they wanted to remind Israel of their heritage. Hey, we don't belong to Babylon. We belong to Israel. We're God's people. And the third reason why they're writing this is because they were trying to prompt Israel to repentance. You need to turn to God. He's our God. We are his people. We need to get out of this nonsense. So that's, that's the first step. Now, that's good. It's good to know facts about the Bible, but the problem is, is, it's, is it's not good enough. You're left with a bunch of facts about the Bible, and what does it have to do with me now today? That takes us to step two. Measure the width of the river to cross. Sometimes it's going to be very narrow, and sometimes it's going to be very wide. And if you look on your, on your picture, that's the second part. That is the river, not the bridge, the river. So in that, you, you ask the question, what is the difference between them and us? What is different between Israel, them, there, and me, Christian America, here, now? What is the difference? And that's going to take you through a couple different things, and some of these are written on your sheet. I don't remember which ones. Culture, language, time, situation, covenant, Jesus, all these things separate us from them. So you're going to make a lot of different notes about what is different. You're going to try and be a detective, find everything that's different that you can possibly find. And now if we look back at that, at, at that passage in uh, 2 Chronicles, uh, where it says, uh, uh, my, um, my people who bear my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. Now we can move on to step two and say, okay, well, what's different? Well, first off, Christians are not a sovereign nation. We exist within the nations of the world, but we are not a sovereign nation. We are all over. We all are the same. There's no difference between an American Christian and a Thai Christian or a Japanese Christian. We're all the same. We're all Christians. There is no current nation which has a covenant with God. No current nation. God made a covenant with the people who he turned into a nation called Israel. That covenant has been set aside, and Jesus has a better covenant in place. This is a whole big conversation that we do not have time for as we, we are running out of time. But the idea here that I want you to get is that Christians don't inherit that land. Now, we have promises about us inheriting the new earth. Yeah, we have that. But as far as here, as having a plot of land in the Middle East, we do not. We do not have that. In fact, much to a lot of uh, people's surprise, Israel doesn't even have that anymore. That land was part of the covenant that they had with God. Well, they broke that covenant, and Jesus fulfilled that covenant. So whereas he has not, he's not done with Israel, he hasn't thrown them away to whatever, he has a lot of promises about their future, the nation of Israel no longer has that covenant with God. They can't go back to, well, we're just going to, we're going to do the Passover again, or we're going to do the Feast of Tabernacles, and no. No, it's too late for that. You, you can't go back to that. They now, now the only way forward is Jesus. With hope, Revelation tells us that there will be some from every tribe who will be saved. So that's good. Uh, going back to this, uh, so Christians are not a sovereign nation. Christians don't inherit the land. We are no longer under the old covenant. They were. 
We are, not a, we are not building a new temple, and we do not gather a specific holy place. There's no difference from us meeting in here to us meeting out there. We don't have a three-part temple where you have to go into the Holy of Holies. We don't have that. None of that do we have. We meet at church, not because there's anything holy about this building, but for the sake of it's easier. We can have lights and AC and speakers. It's easier. It's like the Sabbath. We don't, Christians don't celebrate the Sabbath. Jews celebrated the Sabbath. Christians don't. In fact, Colossians tells us, don't let somebody be ornery about this. If they try and condemn you about observing the Sabbath, don't listen to them. If they want to observe the Sabbath and the holy days, that's, that's their business, but you don't have to under, under Christ anymore. We don't come to church on Sunday because it's Sabbath. We come here because we are gathering together in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a difference. So, uh, and actually, if you look at the 12, uh, I mean, sorry, the 10 commandments, the only one that wasn't uh, repeated in the New Testament was the Sabbath. All the other ones were repeated, all nine of them, but the one that was not repeated was about the Sabbath. Pretty crazy, right? So anyways, uh, these are all the, all the differences. That takes us to the third, uh, the third step of the interpretive journey. What is the main idea? Okay, so cr- now we are crossing the principalizing bridge. That's the principalizing bridge. <laughs> that, that's the bridge over the water. Like that, that song, was it by Simon, Simon and Garfunkel or whoever was? What? Yeah, but wasn't that Simon and Garfunkel? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Uh, okay, so crossing the principalizing bridge. And this, you ask the question, which I'm going to ask in two different ways, because this first way is kind of, what is the theological principle in the text? And you might say, now, what does that mean? And that's exactly what I said. So I just decided to put it in easier words. What is the main idea? Okay, that, I, I think everybody can understand that. Um, and in this st- stage, you're not creating meaning. You're discovering meaning that is already there. You are fir- th- this, this, stage, uh, th- this step has two different stages. Stage one is find the similarities between the passage and now. What is the same from those people there to us now? And then how do those similarities connect with what the Bible was trying to teach its hearers? Okay, so another way of saying that, what is timeless? What is the same yesterday and today? The exact same. In that passage, there's something there that is the same. And if it's not the covenant, that God will keep the covenant that he made with Israel, if that's not the timeless principle, then what is the timeless principle? So does the principle agree, when you're writing a principle, you have to ask, is this agreeing or connecting with the rest of Scripture? If you come come up with a principle and it doesn't agree with the rest of Scripture, you're wrong. You've got to try again. Um, I'll give you an example here in just a minute of a false principle and and a good principle. So principles are, this is all listed on your thing, principles are reflected in the text. You are not creating it yourself. It is reflected in the text. Saying enough. Uh, principles are timeless and not situation-specific. They are not only applicable to what was happening in the Old Testament. They're not only applicable to what is happening today. They are timeless. They are above the culture. They agree with all of Scripture. They're relevant then and now. So uh, maybe an example of a false principle is, okay, so they worshipped God by Sacrificing animals. What's different? Well, I'm not a Jew, so the principle must be we need to an- we need to have animal sacrifices. No, that is a false principle. You know because it disagrees with the rest of Scripture. Does Scripture say that we no longer need sacrifices? Yes, it does. In fact, I'll give you a curveball. The Book of Hebrews says that even back then, the blood of bulls and goats never brought forgiveness of sin. So why on earth did God have them do it? Well, that is Hebrews. We'll be studying that on Wednesdays. So um, how can we apply? Let's, let's go back to that, that passage in, in Second Chronicles. Let's look at some similarities. First off, we are still God's people. That hasn't changed. Um, God hears our prayers. That has not changed. Uh, God will forgive us when we turn to him. We are the temple. 
These are these are these are these are some things. But now that that last one, we are the temple. That that wasn't the same back then. That's that's new. Back then they had to go to a place. Now the temple of the Holy Spirit is within us. So that is that is something that's different. Um, probably should have put that in point two. Okay, so some principles that we could draw from this. First off, God hears and is attentive when His people turn to Him. If you are living in sin, if you are a Christian who has gotten caught up in sin and you turn from your sin and turn back to God. He will hear you when you turn back. That is a principle. We can see that. He did it then. He'll do it now. Nothing's changed. God is still the same God. Now, that there is a day when that will no longer be true. When the new heavens and the new earth come, that there won't be an option for that anymore. So, okay, uh, maybe another principle is you could say God will prosper his people who turn to him. God will be with us as we go through these different, different things in life. That's not to say that every single thing is going to work out, but... Okay, so then the fourth thing we could say, I'm sorry, the, it's the fourth step of the journey. This is the picture on the right. It has a bunch of paths leading off. It's like a road that splits out. And that, this is grasp the text in our town. This is the application. Another way of saying it is, how does it apply to me? How do I respond to the text? After I read the Bible, what am I supposed to do with it? What does it have to do with the day, with the trials and tribulations I'm going through today? What does it have to do with it? Um, so as, there, there's a big contrast between principles and applications, okay? Principle is step three, application is step four. Principle is the overriding theme. Application is, how, what does that have to do with me? Okay, so a principle is one. When you go to the text, it's going to be one principle for many thoughts, for many applications, for every one principle, you have a lot of applications. There's going to be very few principles in any given text. There's going to, it's, going to have, it's going to apply in, in many different ways. Principles are broad. God is faithful. Applications are specific. God will help me in this conflict with this coworker. Principles are broad. Applications are specific. A principle could be God wants people to live truthfully. That's pretty broad. An application would be, I shouldn't tell my kids that Santa is real. I am applying the principle. If God wants me to be a truthful person, then I'm going to practice that truthfulness in how I treat my kids. See, there's, a, there's, a, there's kind of a, that's how you kind of take it from one, one, to, one to two. And once again, uh, there's going to be some things that you read in the Bible that are going to convict you, that doesn't mean that everybody in the whole world has to follow them. Okay, I know a lot of good Christian parents who tell their kids that Santa Claus is real. That's none of my concern. I don't care. It's, that's, that's their family. They can do it however they want. I don't do that to my kids because I want them to know that if I say something, it's true. See what I mean? Like, that's my personal hang-up. I do that from Scripture, and that's, that's my thing. So in, as we take back on St. Chronicles and we ask, okay... So how does Second Chronicles apply to me today? Well, first off, we see that it's not a promise to America. There is no promise made in Scripture that if America turns, that we're going to prosper. Now, I would say that, yes, you turn from your sin and God does prosper you, and any nation can, can benefit from that, but not because God has a covenant with them, because God is a gracious and merciful God. If the nation as a whole were to just everybody stop and be like, okay, we're in a pickle, and God, please help us. Please forgive us. Yes, I bet you God would do something really big in this nation. Absolutely. And we definitely do need that. We do need the Holy Spirit moving. But that does not mean that God has a covenant with America, because he doesn't. Okay? We were founded as a, Christian, as a Christian nation. I absolutely agree. That doesn't mean that just because we decided that we wanted God in our nation, that does not mean that God said, okay, I guess I have to make a covenant. Because Jesus got rid of the covenant. He's not going to go backwards. This is one of the problems with Islam, is it took Christianity, which freed us from the law, and it said, let's go back to the law again. It'll be fun. <laughs> it is, it is, you can't do that. <laughs> we're, we're past it. Um, so uh, some ways that it, could, that it could apply, if you look back at St. Chronicles, when it said, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon that night and said to him, I have heard your prayers and I have chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. We can look at that and say, that we are chosen and consecrated by most holy God. That's how this applies to us. He has accepted our sacrifice. As we come and we, sacrifice, we, we offer up our life to him, 
we do, we do ministry and service to him, he accepts that. He has already accepted us. We don't offer him sacrifices because we are trying to earn his favor. He's already accepted us. And so we can offer him these sacrifices. Because of your blood that you shed and because you set me free, have my life. See, totally different, total difference of perspective. And the law was, the law was pointing to this the whole time. It's just that the Jews kind of missed it. Um, and so he, he has accepted our sacrifices and he is attentive to our prayers. Look at this. If I shut the sky, or hold on, where is it? I have chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. We are the temple of sacrifice. And he has accepted us. How amazing is that? And when you hop down here a couple of verses, it says, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Yes. What we today, this still applies to us today. When, when you as a Christian are in sin and you turn from that sin, he will hear and he will forgive. My eyes will now be open and my ears attentive to prayer from this place. When you are on good terms with God, he is attentive to your prayers. He hears you. He does care. That's what this just said. And I have now chosen and consecrated this temple. You are that temple. So that my name may be there forever. God's name is in the temple of your heart. How amazing is that? And that's how it applies to us today. And so you can go through these, this process on any given text and be able to find things. Now, obviously, there are also general things that you could apply. Like, okay, from this same passage in St. Chronicles, we could say, well, God is faithful. Okay, yeah, we definitely see that there. We can see that God punishes uh, those who are living in sin. Absolutely, we see that, right? He said, I'll withhold the rain. So we do see that God does uh, punish immorality whether it's in the church or not in the church. So, I mean, that's some things to keep in mind. God also said that he would judge the church first before he judged the world. So keep that in, in mind when you're wanting God to judge an immoral culture. The judgment starts in the house of God first. So maybe be a little bit careful with that, huh? <laughs> Any questions on that? We are right at 6 o'clock. Any questions? Those are the, and we're going to build on the four steps in the, in, the coming five, in the next five weeks, okay? So don't feel like, oh, I missed it. <laughs> no, we're going to build on that and show you more. Uh, we're going to get more into the bread and butter of what's called um, ex- ex- exegesis. That's what it's called.